make this noise because you don't have the fun little perforated thing that we have in summer bolts and it's a great time. On this is a little bit of information we'd like to get from you. I'm looking at a lot of people I know in this room and well, I still want you to write this down because we still, still do this. Write down your name, write down a little bit about yourself. We love to know that you're here. And then if you would take and flip over to the other side, this is important. We need some information from everybody, including y'all. By the way, if you're following along from home, if you want to send us an email or a call with this information, we'll take it. One of the reasons we're going to two different uh, Christmas Eve services, five o'clock and eight o'clock, is so that we can spread out in here without asking anybody to go into the fellowship hall. That only works if we're actually somewhat coming to the five o'clock and the eight o'clock service. So we're asking for some information from you all. Let us know which service you plan on coming to so that we can make sure it's going to work out the way we think it's going to work out in our head. Please give us that information. And again, if you're watching at home, Send us in. Send that uh, by email. Make a phone call. We'd like to know just so we can make sure this is going to work the way that we want. Two things underneath that. The year 2021 is almost here, and isn't that great? Well, one of the events that we're going to have in that on January 9th is a Saturday morning first aid training. If you are out on your first aid, this is not a CPR class, just first aid, the fire department's going to come in. We certainly want all of our safety team members to do that. We'd love to have our deacons and our teachers do that. Come on in. Let us know that you'll be there so that we can have plenty of materials. We want you there. And underneath that, the final thing on this tear-off, we're still looking for help caroling to our shut-ins and our older members who would love to see people. Please do this. It's not going to be hard and it's going to be a lot of fun, but we need more people to sign up to help us with that. Rest of this, a couple of things that I want to point out. I'll talk about Lottie Moon and I'll talk about the homebound plants at the end of the service during the offering. So if you would, look at the very bottom block that says blood drive. They are in desperate need of blood, so please come on Thursday, December 17th. They will be here all afternoon. It's going to be in the fellowship hall, so you don't have to worry about the, those who have trouble in the blood mobile. They're going to be in the fellowship hall. Please come and give. They have been begging us to spread the word. And then next to it, one thing that I need to note, you'll notice under Upward Skills and Drills Camp, the, the dates are Saturday, February 23rd and 30th. That would leave it to 2021 to actually give uh, February 30 days. Those days are actually supposed to be February 20th and 27th. We'd like you to start spreading this word to the kids who would be playing basketball with us. We're going to have a three-week camp, a Saturday camp. We want the kids to come out to that. It'll be a great time. That information that you need is there. Registration starts next Monday. Pass the word. We want to make the best we can of this year. And that, my friends, is all I have to say about that. My name is Matt, Ma Matt Ward, and I'm the last man standing. <laughs> and if we make it till next Sunday, come on back, because it'll be a good one. This week, we are going to celebrate Jesus Christ with the greatest songs that we have that declare that he is not just a baby in a manger. He's not just our Lord and our Savior. Jesus Christ is God. He is God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, who loved us so much that he left it all to come to earth to be with us. And we celebrate that. Whether we're here or whether we're at home, we celebrate that. Let's pray, and let's get ready to share that song then together. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for this season. We're so thankful that you are so much greater than the trials that we face in this place. And while our hearts go out to our friends and our family members who are dealing with not just quarantine, but some of them are sick, and we, we, we worry about them, and we ask that you intervene in their lives. For the people who are taking care of them, for the people who are going to have to pick up the slack in their workplaces, 
give everybody an extra dose of grace and energy in these days to come. But right now, Lord, help us to focus our hearts and our minds on you and all that you've done for us, so worthy of our praise. We thank you for all of these things, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. Let's sing Hark the Herald and we'll sing together. Sing together. Testament reading today comes from Isaiah 43 and 53 and reads, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Our New Testament reading comes from Colossians 1, 19 through 22. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by God, Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And now we've got a few um, thoughts and words that Pastor David sent to us for this Sunday. Faith, not fear, or faith over fear, has been a common phrase this year. Perhaps you have seen a sign in your yard or others declaring your faith in God in spite of all that has happened in our world in 2020. God speaks through Isaiah to command us not to fear, and he gives us the reasons why. We can have peace in our hearts and minds that we belong to God. He knows us by name, and no matter what we go through or face, he is with us. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. God doesn't say we won't go through fiery trials or pass through raging rivers, but he does promise to see us through them to the other side. Most of all, he promises to deliver us from sin through Christ's death on the cross and to make us right with our holy God. He bought us by his blood shed on the cross. This is the reason the Prince of Peace was born. Let us pray together. Father God, we come before you this worship day, having been reminded from your word that we are not to fear the things of this world, for we are yours. We know, Father, the fear we have is a godly fear, a reverent fear, which you expect from us. Father, when you called us to yourself, you imparted many good things unto us. One of those is the gift of faith, and we thank you dearly for that. Father, this gift sustains us through the trials we face while on this earth. But also, Father, through this gift allows us to know with great assurance, you, God, are all-powerful. You are all-knowing, and you are ever-present with each of us every day. And Father, as we enter this Christmas season and celebrate your son's birth, it is by faith, not fear, we look forward and know you are with us. It is with all confidence we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and continue to declare the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Angels.
kids will know that Miss Lindsay is coming forward. That means you need to come on up. She is sharing the children's sermon with us today. It should be on and good to go. So y'all come on up and, and gather around in front of her. You've got to be able to see the screen. Everybody's got to be able to see the screen. All right, good morning. If you have your Lottie Moon Bank, I love it, Mackenzie. Thank you. you when you put it in the white box for us, good job. We're going to put our banks up here next to our offering boxes. Now, do you know why we collect money in our little banks? Does anybody know that? Why? Because it's donations. It is donations, and that means it's an offering, which is above and beyond what God tells us that we need to do. And the wonderful thing about an offering is it's, this offering is named after a lady named Lottie Moon. Now, you have to be really special to get an offering named after you which I think is really cool. But do y'all know who Lottie Moon is or what she did? No? Well, we're going to learn about that today. So if we can look at our screens, we're going to see if it'll pop up. That is a picture of Lottie Moon, and that is a picture of her plantation that she grew up on. So she was named Charlotte Moon, okay? And she was born back a long, long time ago. Okay, before any of us were born, okay, in Virginia. But the cool thing about Lottie Moon is that she later on moved to Georgia, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. But she lived on her family's plantation, and she was one of seven, I believe, that she had six siblings, okay, which was pretty cool about Lottie Moon. All right, so let's go on to our next little piece about her, that she had her, we already talked about that, she grew up on her family's plantation, which is pretty cool, a big old farm, okay, so she knew how to do lots of cool things and work with her family on their farm. When she went off to school, she studied Latin, literature, history, and philosophy, 
four major things, which is really neat. So that means she was pretty smart, don't you think? <laughs> I do too. All right, so then after she finished in school, she decided that she wanted to become a teacher. So she taught in Kentucky, and she taught in Georgia, where we live. I know, isn't that cool? So she ended up being in Cartersville, Georgia, and she attended Cartersville Baptist Church. That's a picture of the church at the time. Okay, and that's when she decided that she wanted to be a missionary while she was attending Cartersville Baptist Church. So while she was there, she applied to work for the International Mission Board. Okay, and she became the first single woman missionary to go overseas. Pretty big deal. And so then that same year, she traveled to China. And that's where she lived for over 39 years. And while she was in China, she only came home to the United States three times. Can you imagine going the majority of your life and only coming home three times? But that showed us that she really loved what she did in China. Okay, so her life as a missionary in China, she decided that she had to get to know the people, right? So, of course, we know that she taught while she was there. She had to learn a brand new language. They didn't speak English, so she had to learn Chinese. Probably not very easy to learn. I agree, Mackenzie, not easy at all to learn. Well, then she knew that in order for them to really, I guess, become her friend so she could build a relationship with them, she had to dress like the Chinese. Okay, and that's the picture of her, and she's kind of wearing one of the um, outfits that they would wear back then, okay? And then she became known as the cookie lady. Because I know, isn't that a cool name? Would you want to be the friend of a cookie lady? Yeah, I would, because, so she became known as the cookie lady around town and at school and in her village that she worked. So all the kids called her the cookie lady because she made these delicious tea cake cookies. And through the children, she would say, well, you need to bring your mom over to visit. And so the kids would bring their mom to meet the cookie lady. They would build relationships. And through that, how, who do you think that Lottie Moon shared about? Do you think she shared Jesus with them? Yes, she did. She was able to share Jesus with all those people in China. But it was so important to her that she knew there wasn't a lot of money for international missionaries living overseas where she was. So that's her handwriting you can see in those letters. And Lottie Moon wrote hundreds of letters back to the United States, back to Cartersville, Georgia, her church, back to friends and family that she knew, begging them to support missions. And eventually they did. Now, I think that is really, really neat about her. So I got some of the writing up there for the adults to see. We got a quote by Lottie Moon next that I want the adults to read. But I have a challenge for you in just a minute. That she led a life of service for 39 years, okay, serving the Lord. And we want to do that too. Now, that does not mean that God's going to send us to China necessarily. He might, but he might want you to be a light in the darkness in your school, maybe to a friend who's going through something hard, maybe to a new neighbor that moves in you don't know anything about. And one thing that we can do is we love food, don't we? Yes, we do. Okay, so this is my challenge. If you want to keep scrolling through, my challenge is that I found Lottie Moon's tea cake recipe. And one thing that she called for was to use a rolling pin. So we found these really cute mini rolling pins that y'all can use. And we got the recipe here. And I want you guys to take one of these home with you and with your parents or your grandparents or your aunt or anybody. I want you to make these tea cake cookies. She named them Send the Light Cookies because through these cookies, she's able to share the love of Jesus. So I want you to make these cookies and maybe you can give them out, maybe to a neighbor. Maybe if your family signs up to go Christmas caroling, you'll be able to give it to them as well. Or you can even take it to school or at the Christmas party. And I want you to be able to share the love of Jesus with them. When they say, ooh, where did you get these good cookies from? You can say, well, there's a lady named Lottie Moon who made them. And then you can tell them a little bit about her, which will point them to Jesus. So we're going to pray. We're going to sing a song with Mr. Matt. And then when we leave for Children's Church, you can grab one of these on the way out. Sound good? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this wonderful day, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the time that we're able to spend time learning more about you. But God, we especially pray right now um, over our offerings that were given with genuine hearts, Lord, that will send missionaries over to places of the world where they might not know the name of Jesus yet, God. We'll help give missionaries more resources to share your love, Lord, and we know that this money will be used to bring you praise, glory, and honor. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.
Now this is a song that I think most of you should know, so I want you guys to stand up. We'll let everybody else stay sitting down, but you guys stand up and sing Silent Night with me. And we'll, if we get to verses you don't know, do your best, but let's sing Silent Night together. sing some more verses together. Darkness flies. Kids who are going to Children's Church, Miss April and Miss Kelly are going to be with y'all. They're heading over to the chapel, which is the next building down. Well, it's all connected, but they're over that way. And then the rest of y'all head on back. We're doing something a little bit different today, and that is we're going to hear a message from David over the screen. And we've, we've tested this, and it works. As of 945 this morning, it worked. I'm so glad I can join you via video today. I look forward to being back with you in person next Sunday. I hope that you've had a blessed first week of Advent. And as we begin our time together, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the technology that allows me to continue to be able to preach your word and share with my church family what you have written in your word, what you've laid upon my heart. And so, Father, I just pray that you would speak through me. I pray that your spirit would illuminate your word for each of us. Speak to our hearts. May we be open and receptive to what your spirit has to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, we focused on hope, and we talked about this idea of delivering good news. At first, there's the good news the angels delivered to the shepherds, uh, but then we also looked at the good news the angels later delivered to the women at the tomb. We saw good news when Jesus was born, and we saw good news when Jesus was risen from the dead. And we talked about how both the shepherds and the women, they became the ones that then had to deliver that good news to others. Such good news is thrilling to hear, you know? But it's even more thrilling, I think, to be able to deliver good news to other people. When you've got something good to share with others, doesn't it just swell up in your heart, and you just can't wait to let that good news out, especially when you know it's something that's going to change someone's life for the present and forever. But before these angels delivered their message of hope, they had to calm the fears of those to whom they were sent. You know, Christmas evokes a lot of emotions. I don't really think of fear as being one of them, do you? I mean, unless you've been naughty and you're worried you're going to get coal in your stocking, 
I mean, I, I, fear just isn't something I think about when I think of Christmas. But maybe this year, more than any other, we have cause to fear. We fear for the future of our nation. We fear the economic impact that might come because of future policies or the pandemic. We worry about whether we're going to get together with family or friends this year for Christmas. But what did the people in that first Christmas, that nativity story, what did they have to fear? Well, Luke 1, 12 tells us when Zacharias saw the angel Gabriel, he was startled and was gripped with fear. And then Mary was greatly troubled at the angel's words to her and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. We also read in Matthew chapter 1 that Joseph was afraid to take Mary as his wife because she was pregnant and the child was not his. And it says that for the shepherds in Luke 2, 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Zechariah and Elizabeth were terrified. Mary and Joseph were terrified. The angels were terrified. And after each of these encounters, the angels commanded the people, do not fear. Every time. Imagine with me being in old Zechariah's shoes or in Mary's or Joseph's or the shepherd's. You're going about your business. You're not expecting anything out of the ordinary when suddenly, boom, a warrior of light appears in front of you. Wouldn't you be the least bit startled? <laughs> I know I would. And then when it dawns on you who it is that's standing before you, might not that startling quickly give way to a holy terror? I think so. But why did those who encounter this blazing intrusion of heaven into earth, why do they react with mortal terror? What is it about our creator that strikes this kind of fear in our hearts? You know, it's no coincidence that the first emotion experienced in the Bible is fear. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Now, who was Adam and Eve afraid of? God. Why? Because they were naked. They were ashamed. They realized they had sinned against God. People fear God because they are sinful and he is holy. We are wickedness. He is righteousness. We are darkness. He is light. We fear God because we are his enemies. We're in open rebellion against him. And he is the one who, was, who, who will judge us. He is the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. This is the rightful source of humanity's fear of God. But is that a good thing? Is this fear a good thing? I mean, we read again and again the command to do not fear God. God commanded Joshua not to fear before he led the Israelites into the promised land. Jesus told his disciples the same thing when he calmed the storm and when he walked on water, when he appeared to them in the upper room after his resurrection, he said, do not fear. But doesn't the Bible also command us to fear God? This can be a little confusing. We're commanded not to fear, but we're also commanded to fear. Proverbs 1.7 tells us that even that the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom. Well, this isn't a contradiction. We have to differentiate between two kinds of fear. There's the fear of an enemy, and then there's the fear of a child. If people are born with this fear of an enemy kind of fear with God because we're at war with God. Paul calls us children of wrath and enemies of God in our minds. The wages of our sinful rebellion is death, physical, spiritual, and eternal. Jesus said that he came as light into darkness, but because our deeds are evil, we hate the darkness, we hate the light, and we love the darkness because we're afraid of being exposed for what we are. This is the ungodly fear that separates people from God. This is the result of sin and shame. It's the fear that Jesus came to conquer on the cross. He took God's wrath upon himself, bridged that gulf between a sinful humanity and a holy God. Peace on earth, 
goodwill toward men. That's what Jesus came to bring. That's what God desires. He desires peace and goodwill between himself and his creation. Jesus wants to rescue us from the dominion of darkness and bring us into his kingdom of light. And once someone becomes a child of God, she's no longer his enemy. She no longer has to fear God's wrathful judgment or eternal punishment. She now has a godly fear. It's like how a child fears their parents or how a servant might fear his master. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's works impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So as Christians, we fear God out of reverence, respect, and love. As children do their parents, as an employee might do for his boss, as an athlete might do for their coach. As Christians, we fear God. But it's not a fear based in punishment. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So as his children, we don't fear God's wrath or condemnation. We, we might fear his discipline though, right? I mean, we, we might fear him allowing us to suffer the consequences of our sin. We might fear his silence, that he will not answer our prayers that he will make us uncomfortable and miserable so as to turn us away from sin and back to himself. The Bible says that God does discipline those that he loves, those who are his children, but it's always done in mercy, not wrath. It's always done to correct, never to destroy. A godly, healthy fear really is a gift. It's not a curse because that fear helps us to shun evil. We read that in how God describes Job. He described Job as blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Where Psalm 33, 18 says, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Now, because of Hebrew parallelism, that psalm means that to fear the Lord is the same thing as hoping in his unfailing love. So if we can agree that there is an important place for godly, healthy, childlike fear, a fear based out of love, one of respect and awe, one that has an awareness that God is great, holy, eternal, and glorious, and the only reason we can stand before his throne is because of his grace. If that's the kind of fear we're talking about, then it can help us understand how his gospel is one of peace. Remember, the angels told the shepherds, do not be afraid. And then he tells them why. I bring you good news. It is the good news, the gospel, that conquers ungodly fear and instills a godly, childlike fear of wonderment and awe and respect. The same good news that brings a thrill of hope for the weary world also brings peace on earth and goodwill to men. Now I want us to look at three ways in which this gospel of peace dispels our fears. How can this good news that we talked about last week, how can it overcome our fear and bring us peace? Well, there's three ways. And the first way is forgiveness. That means we have peace with our past. When we think of peace, we usually think of nations at war suing for peace or people, activists, trying to stop a war from happening in the first place. But the greatest conflict in our world today isn't between nations. It's between kingdoms. It's between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world. It's between the kingdom of light and the dominion of darkness. Ever since the Garden of Eden, a sin war has raged between the holy creator God and a sinful, rebellious humanity. We read this in Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving 
of wrath. Now, Paul also goes on in Romans 5.10 to say that we were God's enemies by nature openly rebellious against our maker. We were born into this world spiritually dead in our transgressions and sins, living according to the ways of the world, following the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. The original source of all unrest and conflict and war and violence is sin. And the general leading that evil army of destruction is Satan himself. There are spiritual powers at work in this world. We must never doubt that. But Paul also says in Ephesians 6, 12, that we are at war not with flesh and blood enemies. Our true enemy are the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So if the real war, if the real war is spiritual, then must not the solution be spiritual as well? If our real enemies are the power of darkness and the spiritual forces of Satan, then presidents, armies, man-made laws, none of those are the ultimate solution. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Our prince of peace is the real hope for peace in this world and in each of our lives. Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And again, we go back to Romans 5. Paul gives God's enemies more good news. He says, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Are you God's enemy this morning? Are you far from him living a life of sin, rebelling against your creator? You, you know, you don't have to be at war with him anymore. Jesus came as the Prince of Peace to reconcile you to your Creator so that He could no longer be your enemy, but could be your Father and your friend. 1 John 1 9 tells us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You can make peace with your past if you put your faith and trust in Jesus as the Prince of Peace who can forgive you of every sin. He will make you into a new creation. He will reconcile you with God and declare you righteous and you will go from being that enemy of God to being his child. Let him rescue you from this dominion of darkness in which you live and make you a citizen of his kingdom of light and life. We can have peace with our past because there is forgiveness for our sins in Jesus. Secondly, we can have peace in our present because we can have wholeness in Christ. Just as Jesus makes peace between us and God through the forgiveness of our sins, he also makes peace right now in our daily lives. In Luke 1, Zechariah, remember, he prayed for God to rescue his people from the hands of their enemies, to enable them to serve God. He says, without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Zechariah then ends that prayer saying, guide our feet into the path of peace. We can have peace with God without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. We can walk that path of peace because he makes us whole. See, the Holy Spirit's work in our lives is what transforms us into the image of Christ. He makes us holy. 
He makes us righteous. And we call this process sanctification, but it's simply this lifelong process by which we become more and more like Jesus. We are more and more aligned with God's heart as he heals our hurts, as he corrects our bad habits, as he removes the hangups in our lives, those things that fracture our souls and our relationships, and he makes us whole again. So the Hebrew word for peace, I've talked about this before, it's shalom. And it involves so much more than just a lack of conflict. It deals with this idea of wholeness and health and well-being. Our prince of peace reconciles us and restores us. He eradicates our hostility with God. And because of sin, he brings us spiritual, emotional, and mental health and well-being where there was only sickness and death and decay. He even restores our broken relationships and brings us peace with other people between our fellow Christians, between our family members and our friends. Paul talks about this in Ephesians 2. Verses 17 and 18, when he describes how Jesus brings the Jews and the Gentiles together, that despite their differences in Christ, they are made one. He says he came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. He's talking about the Gentiles and the Jews. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. How do you need Jesus to be the Prince of Peace today in your daily walk? in your relationships, in your workplace or at school. I pray that you would let Jesus bring peace and wholeness to your present situations, whatever they may be. Let him work through you to bring reconciliation and restoration and healing to make whole whatever is wounded and broken in your life today. You can have peace in your present because Jesus, the Prince of Peace, makes us whole. And finally, we can have peace for the future. And that gives us hope. This ties right back in to last week's theme, doesn't it? We have hope because Jesus gives us peace for our future. It's what the shepherds hear the angels sing about. It's that long-awaited promise, that yearning for peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Jesus, our Prince of Peace, not only gives us peace with our past through the forgiveness of our sins, not only gives us peace in the presence through his healing and restoring power, but he gives us peace for the future. He gives us that hope that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to worry about what tomorrow holds because we know who holds tomorrow in his hands. I know that sounds a little cliche, but it's so true. We can trust the one who holds in his hands what we can't even see. Well, we can't even begin to predict it will be like God. Not only knows it, but he holds it. When Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. He tells us, take heart. I have overcome the world. He was giving us hope. When Jesus tells us that he's going to prepare a place for us and he will come again for us to take us there, he's giving us hope. Paul tells us there's coming a day when every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue will confess even below the earth in, in, in all of creation everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord that's that promise that Jesus is coming back again to finish his redemptive work to make all things new to wipe every tear from our eye that is hope world peace will only come when Jesus comes again to make all things new. Oh, we can, we can get little bits of it here and there. We can catch glimpses of it. We can have temporary respites from conflict, but real world peace is only gonna come when Jesus returns. And all people, the Bible says, from every tribe and tongue and nation will gather as one around the throne to worship the lamb who was slain. And we will be at peace with one another and with God. In the meantime, we're going to have trouble in this world. We will have days where we are shaken by news stories that we hear on a daily basis. We have faced difficult circumstances this year. Amen. I mean, COVID-19 uh, has been difficult. The, the lockdowns, the loss of jobs and businesses, the financial heartaches and headaches and the loss of loved ones. It has been a very difficult year filled with uncertainty, but we faced difficult circumstances long before 2020, long before words like COVID or quarantine or social distancing entered into our vocabulary. 
And we're going to continue to face tough, tough times. 2021 is not going to be uh, a perfect Eden. We're going to have difficulties next year too. But take heart. Jesus, he's already there. He knows what's coming. He's victorious already. He has already overcome all of this. He's already defeated sin and conquered death. He reigns victorious and he is coming again. And for that reason, nothing can ever separate us from God's love for us. We don't have to fear what the future holds. We already know how the story is going to end. The outcome for us is guaranteed. And for this reason, we don't have to fear our past sins and hurts. We don't have to fear our present difficulties. And we don't have to fear tomorrow's troubles. What we can do as Paul instructs us in Philippians 4, we can rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. <laughs> Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. You've heard the good news of the Prince of Peace. And I think you know what you have to do. Let Jesus make peace with your past sins. Put your trust in him for salvation, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Let him make you right with God. We're gonna stand and sing in just a few moments. And whether you're there in the sanctuary or like me, you're worshiping from home, I'm gonna ask, ask yourself this. Where do you stand with God right now? If you were to find yourself today standing before his throne in all of his holiness, what would happen to you? Would you be standing before God as an enemy or as a child? Would your sins be there condemning you before him? Or can you say with certainty that Jesus Christ has already washed them away? If you have any doubts, about that, I pray that right now you would simply say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I've rebelled against you and I've tried to live life my own way and I know that my sins make me guilty before you and I have no right to expect anything from you but condemnation and eternal judgment. But today, I throw myself on your mercies and I ask that Jesus Christ, because of his death on the cross for my sins and his resurrection from the dead, that Jesus would give me forgiveness right now. Wash away all of my sins. And I pray you would come and live within me and help me to walk in your ways, to follow your path of peace. Make me right with a holy God, Lord Jesus. I put my faith and trust in you and I turn from my sins today. If you pray that prayer and you mean that in your heart, that's the desire of your heart, the Bible says, you will be saved. Right now, this moment, you're made at peace with God. Your past is behind you and your future is certain. Amen. I hope you've made that decision. If you have, come down front. Uh, let, uh, let the church know you've made this decision. Uh, if you're online, send us a message. Reach out to us. We'd love to celebrate this with you. But secondly, I pray that you would let Jesus make peace in your present. He alone can make you whole. He alone is that source of healing and restoration for whatever is broken in your life today. Whatever struggles you're going through, whatever trials that you face, whatever your hurts, your habits, or your hang-ups, turn them over to Jesus. The altar will be open if you want to just come and kneel and pray this morning. And just say, Jesus, forgive me for trying to, to fix these broken pieces on my own. I give them to you. Would you mend them? and give me peace in the present. And finally, you can have peace for the future. He is our hope. 
no matter what tomorrow holds, no matter what uh, decisions you might have to face tomorrow, God is already there guiding you. He's already there at work making all things new to make sure that everything works out for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. So don't be anxious. Whatever it is that's bringing anxiety to your heart, again, turn it over to Jesus. Trust in him and know his peace. If maybe God is leading you to unite with this church family or to make public a decision you've already made for Christ, we invite you to come down now as well. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that no matter what we are facing in our lives, no matter what we've done in the past, no matter what tomorrow holds, we can obey your command, do not fear. Because your gospel brings us a peace that passes all understanding, a peace that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, a peace that dispels fear and fills us with hope and wholeness and forgiveness and allows us to rejoice in the Lord always, no matter what our outward circumstances Thank you for all of this, Father. I pray for these who need to make a decision today that your spirit be at work in them, drawing them ever closer to you. May they step out in faith and trust and obedience to you today and in the days to come. In Jesus' name, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being in worship with us today. And now as we stand and as we sing, would you come? And make public whatever decision God has laid upon your heart. I won't tell him that nobody stood when he said to stand. <laughs> Let's stand and sing. If you have a decision that you need to make, Jay Poston is here for you. He's here. Come talk to him. Let's sing together. Oh,
everybody have a seat. And I am going to take advantage of having a microphone that can go places. And if I've, if I've heard this right, Cam has come forward for baptism because he's a Christian. And he wants to declare to the whole church and to his family and his friends that Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior. And if you are as thrilled about hearing that news as I am, please say a hearty amen. 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 Now, at the end of the service, we'll have him stand up and wave, but we've also got a business meeting, so everything will be just a little bit different. Y'all sit tight for a second. We've got one more thing to do before the end of the service, and that is to talk about the offering. You guys heard Miss Lindsay's presentation on Lottie Moon. This time of year, we take up the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions. It's something that Southern Baptist Church, well, not just Southern Baptist Churches, but Southern Baptist Churches all over the world gather money and we use that to send missionaries everywhere so that they don't have to worry about coming back home to raise funds. And she told you an awful lot about Lottie Moon. I've got one video that, I love this video, it reminds us of how serious our mission agency takes their job. I'd like you all to watch it as you're thinking about, uh, as you're thinking about what you want to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And then I've got one last reminder to our folk who are going to be voting by dropping off your ballot. You've got until one o'clock, so now is the time that you need to start thinking about getting in your car and coming this way. Let's watch this short video about Lottie Moon. For 175 years, God has given life to this organization. He has called us to go. Thousands have answered that call, and Southern Baptists have joined together to send them. From every walk of life, from every part of our country, they boarded ships and planes, leaving behind all that was comfortable, predictable, safe and secure. All to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Into deserts and jungles, across mountains and seas, they planted their lives preaching Christ crucified. Many completed their service and came back to their homeland, but some did not. Some would perish on the field. They would starve, become ill, or be struck down on distant and dangerous roads to present the gospel. And some would be struck down for simply preaching the good news of Christ. In moments of extreme violence, many would choose to stay in danger to bring peace to those in the midst of chaos. Those are dark days for all of us. When we lose our brothers and sisters, when we feel the very real sting of death. On those days, we all ask, is it worth it? Is it worth the high price, the ultimate price? Etched on the hearts of missionaries throughout time are words like these. My life is of no value. My aim is to finish the race. To live is Christ and to die is gain. So we take up our cross to be living sacrifices. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. These lives were not lost. These lives were given. 
We may never know the full impact these missionaries have given on this side of eternity, but some stories we do know. Stories of God pouring out His Spirit on tribes and nations because missionaries modeled the one true sacrifice. Generations forever altered. Life is a gift. How will you use the life you've been given? Christmas offering, you are supporting an agency that takes what it does very seriously and is very committed to it. And you can trust that the money that you give will be used well. I encourage you to give to Lottie Moon, and that's why. I've got one more thing that I'd like to encourage you to give to, and that is our basket, or, or sorry, our plants for the homebound. This year we're giving rosemary bushes to them, and all you need to do add on a little bit more to your, your tithe check and say, hey, I'd like this much of it to go to homebound plants and we'll take care of it from there. Still a lot of people in need, please continue to give to the Go and Tell Fund and the help that we give to Mana and others through that. This is a time of year everybody is, is feeling it. And I'm sure you guys are too, but let's continue to be generous. You've got the boxes here at the front and at the back, drop that off on your way. Now with that, Got one last wonderful thing to say before we sing a song, and that is, if he's, if, if he's okay with this, would you stand up and wave at everybody in the congregation who's here? This is Cam Johnson. And ordinarily, we would ask you to stand here and everybody would come by and shake your hand, and that's, that's less fun for kids than you guys might think. So make sure that you guys, as you're walking by and see him, say, how proud you are of him and how excited you are that we get to be together as a church. And that's such a great thing. And thank you for making this day a great day because today is a great day. With that, we're going to sing a song. I'm going to turn this over to Jay Poston, who is the chairman of our deacons. So after this song is done, we are going to be dismissed into a business meeting, which means we're going to flip the radio off. We're going to stop the broadcast because you don't need to watch us sitting and filling things out. So when this song is over, goodbye to everybody online. If you are voting, make sure you hop in the car and head this way before one o'clock. You have to be present for your vote to count. And for those of you who are here, thank you for being here. Let's stand together and sing one more song together. Go tell it on the mountain. Let's sing together. Come.